In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. It's my pleasure to be with all of you in the beloved diocese, beloved of Christ, diocese of London. And I like to thank uh, my father, His Grace Bishop Angelus, for this kind invitation to be with you today uh, during the Holy Great Fast. And uh, through the prayers of uh, the fathers, the clergy, and all of you, may the Lord give us uh, wisdom to reflect a little bit on um, the Holy Great Fast. In the fraction of the Holy Great Fast, we say fasting and prayer are those which the people of Nineveh pursued until God had mercy on them forgive them their sins, and lifted his wrath away from them. And also, the Lord Jesus Christ said about the Ninevites that they would stand in the day of judgment, and they would condemn the generation in which the Lord Jesus Christ lived, because they believed and repented at the preaching of Jonah, but uh, <clears throat> the people did not believe or repent at the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, many of them. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than Jonah. So I think the Lord Jesus Christ is asking us to reflect on the repentance of the Ninevites. And this will be like an example to all of us uh, to follow this style of repentance in order to um, have, have the mercies of God dwell upon us. So let's read from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, starting from verse 5, and we will reflect on these verses. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not, per we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Glory to the Holy Trinity. So if we analyze the repentance of the Ninevites, it started with believing God, as we read in verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. That's the first step. Jonah went to Nineveh and told them, after 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. So they believed this warning. And believing God was the first point in repentance. Maybe when all of us hear this, we say, we all believe God. So we don't have problem with this issue. But in reality, we say we believe God, but in reality, we don't. And I will tell you why I say we don't believe God. God said 
several times that no liars will enter the kingdom of heaven as you read in the book of Revelation. Uh, the liars will be outside the heavenly Jerusalem. And in spite of this, if we believe it, why we lie until now? Why until now, although all of us want to go to heaven, but why do we still lie? Either we believe God or we are not taking him seriously. Another example in the Sermon on the Mountain, the Lord Jesus Christ said, he who says to his brother, foolish one, he deserves the fire of hell. And until now, we curse one another. And there are several examples. So do we take God serious or not? Do we take his warning serious or not? The people of Nineveh took the warning when Jonah told them, after 40 days, God will overthrow your city. Then everyone actually believed God. They took God seriously. Our problem, we don't take God serious in our life. We know all this warning, but we don't take him serious enough to respond to this warning. Number two, they proclaimed a fast, as we read in verse five. The people of Nineveh believed God proclaimed a fast. Why they proclaimed a fast? Fast, how fast is related to repentance? We know that our body and the desires of the body a war against the flesh. There is continuous war between the body and the spirit. I'm sorry, spirit. So there is a war between the body and the spirit. And in any war, if the two, if two persons are fighting together, who will win the war? The stronger. So if our body and the desires of the flesh are stronger than the spirit, then the person would be carnal. But if the desires of the spirit are stronger than the desires of the body, the person will be spiritual. So when we fast, as St. Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, St. Paul said, lest after I preach to others, I myself be disqualified. So when we fast, actually, we discipline our body and we bring it into subjection. We put it under the control of the spirit. So in this war between the body and the spirit, we will find the spirit is stronger than the body. Then the spirit will win this war and the person will be a spiritual person, not a carnal person, led by the desires of the spirit, not by the desires of the flesh. Later on, the Lord Jesus Christ said to us about demon, this, this uh, kind, cannot come out by anything except by prayer and fasting. So another reason why we fast, in order actually to overcome Satan. Satan cannot actually be defeated except through prayer and fasting, as the Lord told us. Uh, they brought a young boy possessed with demons to the disciples, but they couldn't actually cast out the demon. So they asked the Lord why we couldn't, and the Lord told them, this kind cannot come out by anything except by prayer and fasting. Also in fasting, we participate in the death of Christ. Although we don't literally die, in, in fasting, but when we abstain from eating and drinking, 
we actually uh, participate in the death of Christ. So by mortifying the, the desires of the flesh, in this way, if we participate in his death, we participate also in his resurrection. And our fasting will take its power and its strength from the fast of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because now we are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the baptism, we put on Christ. So any spiritual activity we do, it is actually accepted before God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ himself. Our fasting will be accepted through the fasting of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because now we are one, we are in union. So when I fast, my fast take its power and its strength and its acceptance before God the Father from the fasting of our Lord Jesus Christ. The third point in the fasting of the Ninevites or in the repentance, they put on sack cloth from the greatest to the least of them. And there are here two points, actually not only one point. The third point, we said the first point is they believed in God, they took him seriously. Second point, they fasted. Third point, they put on sackcloth. They put on sackcloth. It's a form of asceticism. Asceticism. So they are not living in luxury, but they humbled themselves before the Lord, even in their clothes. And fasting should be a time of asceticism in everything, in food. Fasting is about simplicity in the food. But if I try to make the best delicious food during fasting and make several kinds of food, etc. Should I question myself, am I really fasting or not? Uh, because fasting has a two dimension, the ascetic dimension and the spiritual dimension. In the ascetic dimension, we should abstain from eating and drinking to a certain time. Then we should control the quantity and the quality of food. Quantity and quality of food. And the people who actually really fasting with asceticism, uh, the, the budget of, of uh, food during fasting time will be less than the budget during non-fasting time. And the difference actually between this budget and that budget should go to the poor and needy. And if I say that fasting is participation in the death of Christ, how can actually I spoil my flesh and make different kind of food and delicious food? And, and then I say I'm fasting. Fasting has to do with discipline and discipline the body and living in asceticism. And the people here, they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And also this goes to shopping, buying new clothes, etc. So during fasting, a person should live in asceticism. The fourth point, it says from the greatest to the least of them, which means communal fasting. Everybody fasted together. And the communal fasting is very important. Many people say, I will fast whenever I want. Uh, <clears throat> and it is individual, something individual between me and God. But the communal fasting is mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament also. Uh, like example, in, in Acts chapter 27, we read, when the fast was over. So here he is referring to a fast that everybody participate in it. 
the communal fast is important because my fasting actually will support your fasting and your fasting will support my fasting. So when we fast, all of us together, then we will strengthen each other's fasting and our fasting will be very, very strong before God. The fasting of the Ninevites here made God had mercy on them and lifted his wrath away from them. The fasting of the Israelites during the time of Esther actually gave Esther grace in the eyes of the king and he did not kill her when she entered without appointment. So fasting actually can do miracles. The mountain of Mu'attam uh, was moved from its place through the power of prayer and fasting. So it is not up to me actually to say I will fast or not. Since there is a communal fasting, all of us we should participate. Everyone, the older, the younger, everyone should participate in the fast. Even here we see the king, as we read in verse 6, then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Uh, sitting in ashes, actually, to remember that, uh, to remind us with the fire. So if we don't repent, uh, God forbid, uh, people actually, their end would be in the lake of fire. So the idea of sitting in ashes to remind the person with the fire, uh, so this like a warning from God, so we can repent and return to God. And by the way, in the Catholic Church, the first day of fasting is Wednesday, not like us. We, the first day in fasting is Monday. And they call it Ash Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. And actually the Catholic people go to the church on Ash Wednesday and the priest make uh, with ashes a sign of cross on their forehead to remind them that this fasting is a time of repentance, returning to God, and the time of asceticism. That is why the day before um, Ash Wednesday, as we have the pre-fast Sunday, had the Rifa'ah, so Rifa'ah will be Tuesday. And they call it in English, Fat Tuesday. In uh, uh, French, they call it Mardi Gras. And the idea of celebrating the day before the fast is to prepare ourselves spiritually to uh, the fast. Unfortunately, now uh, Mardi Gras uh, in many, many states and in some countries uh, take a very ungodly celebration. And uh, I wonder how can we prepare ourselves to the fasting with all these ungodly practices. And the, the king actually called a communal fast to everybody, as we read in verse 7, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. So according to their knowledge, because Nineveh was a pagan country, so according to their knowledge, they let even the beasts and the animals to fast with them. And they actually uh, proclaimed uh, total abstinence, total abstinence from eating and drinking. And this is the reason why actually we fast 55 days. 
uh, some people actually, they try to find explanation, so many different explanation uh, about why we fast 55 days. But when you study the church history, you will find that the early church knew either the fast of six weeks or the fast of eight weeks, six weeks and eight weeks. Six, because six by seven is 42. So that is the 40 days that the Lord Jesus Christ fasted. But why eight weeks? Because on Wednesday, on Saturday and Sunday, we don't abstain. And the people wanted to abstain every day. So since the people abstain five days in the week, excluding Saturday and Sunday, then actually they need eight weeks uh, to fast 40 days, five by eight, 40. But the eight weeks is 56 days. And from here came the 55 days. Algeria was uh, a pilgrim, a pilgrimage in, in the fourth century. And she visited Jerusalem and stayed there three days and recorded all her observation. You can find her writing. Her name is Algeria. You can find her writing in the ancient Christian uh, literature. And she said in Jerusalem, they fast eight weeks. And she explained why the eight weeks, because they don't abstain on Saturday and Sunday. So five by eight would be 40. But Egypt, they fasted six weeks. In Egypt, the cops fasted six weeks, not eight weeks. What happened when people went to Jerusalem uh, to visit the Holy Sepulchre and the Golgotha? And so, and they know that the people in Jerusalem fasted eight weeks. So when they returned back to uh, Egypt, they said, since I visited the Holy Land, now I will fast eight weeks like the people in Jerusalem. And actually this custom is still, we have it here, like in St. Mary fast. Some people, they fast three weeks, some people fast one month, some people fast uh, as they abstain completely until sunset. Some people, they don't eat fish, although all these things are allowed. A fish is allowed in St. Mary fast. It's only 15 days. Absence should be until 3 p.m., not until 6 p.m. But some people, they do extra asceticism. So back then, uh, some people actually, they start to fast eight weeks since they visited the Holy Land. So we ended up in Egypt having two groups of people, group fasting six weeks and group fasting eight weeks. And since more people actually visited the Holy Land, so the number of the people who visited the eight weeks start to grow. And in order to have unity among all the cups, and since also we, we in, in Egypt, we abstain on Saturday and Sunday. So in Egypt, actually, we adopted the fast of eight weeks. That's why now we are fasting the 55 days. So here in Nineveh, they completely abstain from eating and drinking. As, as we read, he said, let neither man nor beast herd or nor flock taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink water. Complete absence. And I, I hope that each one of us, we can abstain for some time, I, for 12 noon, one, two, three. Uh, according to the church, we should abstain until sunset. But each one according to his ability and according to the guidance of his spiritual father, 
But abstinence is something very, very important in fasting. Because if we eat in the morning, the first meal is called the breakfast. Breakfast means breaking the fast. And as his Holiness Pope Shenouda used to say, if we eat in the morning, then we are vegetarians, we are not uh, fasting. So the people believed in God, they proclaimed the fast, they practice asceticism. It was a communal fast. Um, everybody participated in it. Verse 8, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. That's number five. Cry mightily to God. Prayer. Prayer. Usually during this fast, when you, you hear the word fasting, you hear prayer. Fasting and prayer. Fasting cannot work alone. Many people ask, we fasted for so many years, but we never felt all these blessings that you speak about. Why? Because fasting does not work alone. If we fast only, then we are changing certain food with another food, and that's it. Fasting works with prayer. That's why the Lord spoke about the demon and said, this kind cannot come out by anything except by prayer and fasting. And I want you to notice here, he did not say and pray. He said, cry mightily to God. Cry mightily to God. Cry, he didn't mean to scream. But cry means the heart, the spirit from within, crying to God. The, can you imagine if a person is drowning and then he is calling for help? How, how he would say it? Would he say, just to please, could you please come and uh, rescue me from drowning? Or he will be crying. In the same way, we need to be crying heartedly, mightily to the Lord in order actually to deliver us, to rescue us to have mercy upon us, to forgive us our sins, to lift his wrath away from us. In the book of Psalms, you hear in many, many Psalms, David said, I have cried to the Lord. Out of the depths, I cried to, to the Lord. To you, O Lord, I cried with my voice. Several, several times. As if David, the only type of prayer that he knew is the crying, crying. So we need to pray with zeal, with sincerity, not just words coming out of our mouth. And with crying, number six, he said, yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. This is what we call repentance. Repentance. Re turning from evil way and turning from the violence, it's repentance. Repentance is actually making like a U-turn. Instead of I'm going away from God, I will make a U-turn and return back to God. And for our repentance to be uh, acceptable before God and to be a true and genuine repentance. It's not enough to say, I repented or I am going to quit this sin. It takes actually several things. It takes, number one, actually, to take responsibility of our sins. If we don't take responsibility and if I know or I am convinced that I have excuses, then it will be very difficult for me to repent. For example, if I have uh, anger problem, and, and I say I get angry because of my boss at work, because of my parents, because of my spouse, because of my children, then I am finding excuse to myself. As long as I did not take responsibility for my anger, 
it will be difficult for me to repent. That's why taking responsibility is very, very important. After taking responsibility, we need to have remorse or to develop godly sorrow, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. St. Paul said, godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. So Peter, when he denied God, he wept bitterly. We need to develop this godly sorrow inside our hearts uh, and to regret what we did. Also, we need actually to make like uh, a resolution that we will do whatever it takes not to return back to this sin again. As St. Paul said in his letter to Hebrews, you did not fight until bloodshed against sin. So we need to fight until bloodshed against sin. Also, we need to do like Zacchaeus, to correct the results of our sins. The, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot, his reaction after betraying the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, number one, we'll find he regretted what he did. Uh, he tried to correct the result of his sins. He took the money and gave it to the high priests back. Uh, he confessed actually his sin. He said, I have sinned because I delivered innocent blood. So he went through all these steps. But what he was lacking, he was lacking the confidence and the trust the hope in God's mercy and in God's forgiveness. That's why it is a very important element to have confidence in God's mercy and God's forgiveness. So in order to repent, as I said, it is like making you turn. We need to take responsibility of our sins. We need to develop godly sorrow. We need to fight until bloodshed against sin, we need to correct the results of our sins, we need to have confidence and trust in God's love and God's forgiveness, and after this comes uh, confession and communion. So before actually I go to Abuna to confess my sins, I, I have to go through these five steps before confession, and communion. So that is how repentance should be. And here the king said, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. And the last point in their repentance, he said, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. And we can see in these words, there was a hope, there was trust in God's forgiveness. He trusted that God may uh, re uh, relent, will turn again, and turn away from his fierce anger, and will not perish. And this is actually what happened. God forgive them, as we say in the fraction, so until God uh, had mercy on them, forgive them their sins, and lifted his wrath away from them. But usually, people ask a question here. Does God change his mind or not? In, or in order, actually, to answer this question, we need to say, where is the camera? What do I mean by where is the camera? We are seeing, from where we are seeing the scene? From heaven or from earth? In heaven, actually, God is timeless. God is above time. In heaven, there is no past, present, and future. God, actually, everything for him is now. There is no past. There is no future. 
it's present. So God in his foreknowledge in, in heaven, he knows everything. He knows that Jonah will go to them, people will repent, uh, actually they will be forgiven. So God is not reactive. God, because everything is, is known for him, that's what we call the foreknowledge of God. So God is not reactive, meaning he did not wait until he saw the repentance and then actually he decided to uh, forgive them. If we speak in this way, then God is not timeless. Then God is not above the time. But God actually is above the time. So if the camera in heaven, I can say there is no change in his mind because everything is known uh, to him even before the foundation of the world. Even before the whole creation, God knows what will happen in man of But for us, if the camera here on earth, I mean, we see things from here on earth within the boundary of time and space. We are living here in time, not outside the realm of time. So there is past, there is present, there is future. So in the past, God sent uh, Jonah with a warning to the people. If they did not repent, the city will be overthrown. In the present, we know that God, uh, we know the people repented. In the future, you know, we will see that God forgives them, you know. So if the camera in, on earth, we see that God actually changed his mind, as he said, in verse 10, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This verse actually is speaking to us from earthly perspective, people who are living in the time, but from heavenly perspective, if the camera is in heaven, this verse actually is addressing actions done in time, but God is timeless, as we say in, in uh, the Gregorian liturgy, غير uh, الزمني, timeless. So he is above time. So while we are fasting this great fast, we need to learn from the people of Nineveh how they repented. They took God seriously. They believed God. They proclaimed a fast. And a fast with asceticism, with humbleness. They actually, this fast was a communal fast. Everybody participated. Nobody said, I only will fast uh, one month, two weeks, whatever. And also, with this fast, they prayed to God. Actually, they cried mightily to the Lord. And with this fast, there was a serious repentance. Serious repentance. Then God saw their works and that they turned from their evil way. So there was a serious repentance. God noticed it. God uh, saw it himself. And with this serious repentance, the last point, they, there was confidence and hope in God's forgiveness, that God will forgive them their sins and God will accept them. So these are the seven points that the people of Nineveh did in order actually to turn away the, the wrath of God and uh, his, his anger, his fierce anger to turn it uh, away. The message to all of us, it is a golden opportunity for us. Even almost five weeks when yeah, passed from this fast. But still, we have three and a half weeks. Three weeks and a half. Let us focus during this time on our repentance, on our prayer, on our fasting. And we should be confident that when we pray and fast, sincerely asking God's mercy to come upon us, 
God actually will have mercy upon us and will forgive us our sins. Not because we are worthy, but according to his mercies, according to the abundance of his love toward us. Uh, we have two aspasmos in uh, one Adam and one Watus during the Holy Great Fast. Uh, the word aspasmos means greeting uh, and have these two hymns, uh, one instead of rejoice O Mary and the other one instead of uh, O Lord God of hosts. The Watus absolve, uh, the Watus uh, Aspasmus actually is taken from Jonah chapter 4 when he said to the Lord, I know that you are a gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So during this fast, we remind us with all these characteristics of God that he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm, harm. So God actually will forgive us our sins for sure, definitely, because not because we are worthy, but because of his kindness, his love, his, his merciful. And this actually, we are reminded with this also in the Adam Aspasmus that says, you did, you, did, you do not desire the death of a sinner, but rather that he returns and lives. So we say, and we know this about God, he does not desire the death of a sinner. God desires that we return and, 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 and live. And, and that's why we say, restore us, O God, uh, to, to your salvation uh, and have mercy upon us. So let us put our confidence in God, ask his gra God, his, God's grace to be with us during this fast to help us to fight the good fight so our fasting will be acceptable before God. And as God actually accepted the fast of the Ninevites, he may accept also our fast and uh, all of us will enjoy the mercies and the forgiveness and in the life after the eternal life with all the saints and the righteous. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Sayyidina. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Sayyidina. And Gilles Biatizir, Sayyidina, and Hawa, Hadar, Dilwati, prayer for the Ukraine, uh, people in Ukraine, for how we gathering. فهو حاضر معهم مع البشوب تاعي وكان فعشان كده هو بي 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 يعني سندنج هيز ابولوجيز ان هو ما قدرش يكون بعرف بعرف معانا سيدنا في شويه اسئله فكريم عنده اسئله في احنا بس هم بيكتبوا الاسئله فكريم عنده الاسئله بعد اذن يافتك هو هيقول الاسئله عشان يافتك ترد عليها ما فيش مشكله سلام سيدنا if young people from the church are not in the habit of fasting and don't have that concept in their lives, how can we encourage them to do so? Number one, actually, we need to explain to them the spirituality of fasting and why we fast. If we just tell them, now we are fasting, you need to fast, maybe he will not accept this. But after we explain and they understand the spirituality of fasting and why we fast, then, according to the guidance of the spiritual father, we may start gradually with them until they enjoy the fast and, and they experience the blessing of the fasting in their life. Then, actually, they will have no problem to keep all the fastings of the church. And there is another question. Thank you, Your Grace, for the very spiritual talk. Can you please explain how can, as a church congregation, support each other in fasting? Thank you. Usually the communal uh, fasting or prayer together, this actually uh, accepted before God more than uh, the individuality. 
Because as we say in the divine liturgy, he made us unto himself an assembled people. And all of us we are members in the one body, the body of Christ. So uh, can you imagine in, in, in our body, if Muslim, our two eyes are not actually uh, seeing in synergy together, then I will have double vision if my hands are not working in synergy together, then the person cannot actually do many, many things. So the harmony of the body means all the organs, all the members work together in harmony. In the same way, when we pray, we pray together. When we fast, we fast together. So there is the communal and the individual. Uh, prayer and the communal fasting. When Peter was in, uh, in prison, uh, the whole church prayed and, and fasted for him. And when they were persecuted by the Jews and they prayed, the place was shaken from the power of prayer. If all of us, we pray together, if all of us, we fasted together, then this, as the Lord said, if two or three assembled in my name, I will be in their midst. When we fast together, we will be in his name for our fasting. Definitely the Lord and the Holy Trinity will be in our midst. And, and this actually can shake heaven and earth. So that, that is the importance of the communal fasting, the communal prayer. Thank you, Sayyidna. Another question uh, from Father Michael. The Ninevites are not Jewish. Why did they believe that God will punish them since they are not believers? But the, in the Old Testament, there are peoples who are uh, called proselyte. Proselyte means he is not Jewish by nation by race, but he joined Judaism as a religion and he worshiped the God of Israel. That's why they are called proselyte. They converted into Judaism. So they know if they believed in God of Israel, God of Israel will consider them among his people and he will accept them. And we have so many stories like Rehab, uh, Rahab, uh, she actually believed in God of Israel and God actually saved her and she became one of his grandmothers. Um, so they know people who are, not Gentile, who are not Jewish, they are Gentiles, but if they feared the God of Israel and worshipped him, God will consider them among his people. These are the proselytes. Thank you, Sayedna. Uh, another question. During Lent, the church encouraged us to do more Bible reading during this time. Is this linked to Deuteronomy 8.3, Matthew 4, that God wants us to focus on his word, or is this not linked to that verse? Uh, in, uh, during the fast, as we read in Joel chapter 2, Proclaim a fast, call for a secret assembly. It is time actually, secret assembly means all my activity or most of it will be directly centered around God. That's why during fasting, I need to pray more. I need to read the scripture more. I need to uh, have um, a quiet time with God more. Uh, reading more, attending liturgies more. So the more in order, do you remember when I said the spirit and the body are fighting together? So I am dis disciplining the body by controlling the nourishment of the body. But I need to nourish the spirit more. All the things that I mentioned are the food of the spirit. Because if I don't nourish the spirit, what will happen at the end of the fast? I will have a disciplined body and a weak spirit. And, and the person will not be spiritual. But if I discipline my body and I nourish my spirit, then the spirit is strong 
and the body is, is disciplined. In this way, the spirit will control the body or lead the body and the person will be a spiritual person. That's why we read the Bible more, we, we pray more, we attend the churches more, we do more prostration, etc. And even in the, in, in the rites of the church, we read prophecies every day in matins, so we do prostrations. All these activities actually targeted toward the nourishment of the spirit. Thank you, Sayedna. Another question is coming. Thank you for this talk, Sayedna. Is lake of fire a real fire or a symbol of people's regret? Again, would you please repeat it? Uh, is the lake of fire a real a lake of fire, fire uh, no, a re or a symbol of people's regret? Uh, no, no, no. It's a real fire. But St. John Chrysostom said the, the fire the eternal fire is different than the material fire. It is not this physical material fire. He said at least there are three differences. The fire here uh, gives light, but the fire in, in hell, it's dark. The second difference, uh, the fire actually here will turn anything into ashes, but the, the fire there doesn't turn things into ashes. So, uh, and uh, the third difference, according to St. John Chrysostom, the fire here is quenchable. You can put it off, but the eternal fire is unquenchable. You cannot put it off. So there is a fire, but when we say a fire, we should not actually think about materialistic fire that, that we have it here. But it is a real fire, uh, and it is not quenchable, it is dark, and it does not turn into ashes. Because the people, many people now in the new theology and new patristic, uh, they say uh, the fire and, and heaven are just a condition. So a person will be happy or be just uh, uh, regretting this in, in uh, in his heart. This actually is the teaching of the Eastern Orthodox Church, but we, the Coptic, the Oriental Orthodox Church, that is, we don't accept this uh, at all. Uh, all the early church fathers uh, spoke about a real fire, like John Chrysostom as explained. Thank you, Sayedna. Uh, another question. Thank you, Sayedna, for the much about making sure we take God's warning seriously enough in our lives. How do we do this in practice and not keeping distracted with the things of the world? And how do we guard again as becoming lukewarm in our face? The, the accountability will help in this. For example, I read the Bible this morning. And I took some exercises to myself. So at the end of the day, I need to hold myself accountable and ask the Holy Spirit to search me and see uh, the, when, when I read the Bible, did I keep the warning uh, and did I take the warning seriously or not? Did I take the promises of God seriously or not? Actually, by taking God serious in our life and holding ourselves account accountable and then asking our father of confession to hold us also accountable and we confess regularly, this will keep the zeal going on in our life. But uh, sometimes we read the Bible, as St. James said, and once we turn the Bible off and we start uh, our day, we forget everything. As St. James said, one looked at his at the mirror to see his face, and then he went away and he forgot everything. Reminding ourselves all the day, this is the message. When, when we read the Bible, I need to ask myself, what is the message to me today from God? What is God's message to me today? And I take this message all the day. I live by it. And at the end of the day, I hold myself accountable. Did I live 
up to this standard or not? If not, I offer repentance. If yes, I will give glory to God who helped me to keep the message uh, in my heart all the day. And then second day, I will do the same. Third day, I will do the same. So the zeal will be always, always uh, uh, kindled. Thank you, Sayed. Now, I'm getting lots of questions. However, really, let me really ask really last, one last one, and then we will be able to send your kind self the questions, and maybe you can answer them offline. So the last question coming, some people say that the story of Jonah is a symbol, not real. How can we answer them? Actually, uh, in last August, here in the United States, and I can send you, uh, I can send to his grace, which one gave us the link. I'm sure maybe he read it already. A person was swallowed by a whale. And he stayed in the whale for maybe 20 hours, 24 hours. And then the, the whale spit him. And he's alive. Th this happened actually last August. So the the... And it came in on all uh, the news here. Uh, and also there is another person, I think in, in London back in the 19th century, uh, the same story happened. Uh, and here's just, I'm speaking about the possibility, but if God actually wants this happen, couldn't God actually make, uh, preserve Jonah in the middle of the world for three days? Definitely he can do this. God is in control of everything. But for us who are weak in our faith, God every now and then sent us a story, a real story that can testify that the story of Jonah is a real story, not a, a, a mythological story. Uh, and as I told you, just in last August here in America, it, it happened with one of the sailors. So we pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Christ Jesus our Lord, for that kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Love of God the Father, grace with his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Communion gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.